एंड वेलकम टू ऑल आई एम अनमोल आई एम एन एफ वन सोशल मीडिया लीड फॉर एसेंशियली स्पॉट्स एंड आई कैन नॉट बिगिन टू टेल यू वॉट एन ऑनर इट इज टू सिट अक्रॉस पेरी मकारथी अ मैन हु नेवर गेव अप एन एक्स एफ वन ड्राइवर एंड समबडी हु डिस्क्राइब्स हिम सेल्फ एज एन अनलकी लैड बट हाउ एवर फ्रॉम वेर आई सी इट ही इज द डेफिनेशन ऑफ बिलीफ एंड अ नेवर से डाई एटीट्यूड हेलो पेरी हाउ एव यू बिन Yeah, they're all good, Anna. Christmas is over. New Year's begun. Looking forward to going forward and having some fun. Oh, is it? What have you been up to these days? Well, the, the, most of my time is spent speaking to large companies in the UK and in Europe, and、um, getting some inquiries now from India and also from America to go and tell you know my story, and it matches in with what companies are doing. You know, if they need a sales conference. If it's about resilience, motivation, creativity, opportunities, keep going, keep pushing, try and get everything possible that you're trying to achieve, and and bring other people with you. So it's all those stories and working with these large companies, and it's it's good fun. I really enjoy it. I treat it the same way as I do motor racing. I need to get the job done and need to try and win the event. That's absolutely amazing to hear. I think on that note, we should start our rounds. My first question to you is: Actually, I was going through one of your interviews, and you said either you would have become a motor racing person or you would have become a criminal. And I, while I died laughing listening to that, I wondered why you said that. So, could you walk us through your journey to F one? Well, the, the 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 journey, the main journey, was actually trying to get to Formula One because when I discovered motor racing, that I really liked it. I was I was quite old, you know. I was eighteen years old, and I was word about my road driving. Sorry, Essex Police, but、uh, word about my road driving、uh, got around to people, and it was the chief instructor at a very famous circuit called Brands Hatch. Who actually came out to get me, and he took me to the track, and I took him around, and that was it. He said, "Right, is you know, I was the best he'd ever seen,"、um, and I said, "I agree, of course." <laughs> so、uh, that was the beginning <laughs> of the journey. But then, of course, I found out immediately that to go motor racing, you need you know quite a lot of money, and I didn't have any, and my family weren't in that position. So I went to work. On oil rigs in the North Sea for two and a half years to actually get the money together to come into motor racing,、mm. and then as soon as I did come into motor racing, I was introduced to Bernie Ecclestone、uh, straight away, who was like、yes. the, the head of Formula One for many many years. And Bernie said to me, "Perry, son, you're twenty one years old. You've got no money. You've got no experience. You've got no sponsors." Your chances of making it to Formula One are about a million to one, and do you know something? Every time I tell that story, I sound more and more like Michael Caine, right? But but that was the thing, <laughs> and all I could think about is, wow, I've just met Bernie Ecclestone, you know. So I I wasn't out to prove him wrong, and Bernie did have a point because really the odds were horribly high coming in at twenty one. Having never raced before, but it was a question of getting my head down and seeing what I could do. So immediately I went out and I was very fast, but I was an idiot. You know, I made so many mistakes. But I got myself sorted out. That that was six races in the first year, and then the following year I went out and won the British Formula Ford Championship. So that gave me the start, and I was making phone calls, walking around. Talking to anybody possible on a train, on a bus, a bus, anything, to say who do you work for, what do you do, can you sponsor me, <laughs> you know, and so that was the journey.、Um, now I could carry on talking here for ages, but that journey was the biggest hurdle. Keep overcoming the fact of no financial backing, no support, and it wasn't like the. The the lads nowadays. I had no manager. I had no trainer. No nutritionist. No this. No that. It was just get up, brush yourself down, get on with it, 
and keep punching as hard as possible on the track and off the track for years to make things happen. That is why I mentioned that you are the definition of belief and a never say die attitude because I've heard you call yourself the unluckiest British driver. However, from where I see it, you just didn't give up. You proved somebody like Bernie Eccleston wrong and you just made it to F1 without any karting experience, which is so rare. Right. So yeah. what do you have to say about that? I, I was kind of there was no choice really so it, it was it was either you know do all this stuff or fail and that was it you know what i didn't want to do is i didn't want to be in my late 20s or in my 30s standing at the bar with somebody having a pint of lager and just saying yeah i could have been a racing driver but i didn't have any money that's rubbish you know just get on and go for it and just try to keep overcoming the hurdles. But there were a lot of hurdles. There was huge resistance to getting sponsorship. You know, I understand the word no in 27 different languages. That's how bad it was, you know? <laughs> so, but oh my God. it was a question of, it was self-belief, yes. But what did mean an awful lot to me is that the more I carried on racing, the more people, some in Formula One and the Formula One journalists and everything else, they were very quick to turn around and support me and just say, look, you know, we really believe in you. We believe that you've got something special. And that was crikey. That, that was so fantastic to hear because it wasn't just me standing barking at the moon. You know, there were other people who were saying, actually, Perry, you may be right. You know, so that was that level of support was something that because I had nobody around me, there was no family, nothing. That support from outside was something that was incredibly important to me. And I, I honestly, I cuddled that support. I embraced it because it was one of the things that helped me keep going uh, against, you know, pretty crazy odds. Yeah. So why I ask you this is because I have a brother who's been testing for Formula 3, but there's the same story of financial constraints. So like, can somebody today be pull a Perry McCarthy or even a George Russell for that matter? Because he went up to Toto Wool with a PPT. He sent, he sent out cold emails and so did you. Like your journey is also pretty similar to that. So what do you have to say to the kids today who are absolutely talented but don't have that kind of money to get into motorsporting? Because uh, let's be honest about it. It's, it is one of the most expensive sports to get into. It's a, it's a really difficult question, to be honest, because I'm all for encouraging people. But there is a reality to this, is that I'm one of the very few people from my background and circumstances that made it through. So by definition, most people will fail. I'm sorry, but that's all there is to it. They're, they're trying to, you know, in premiership football, I think, I'm not sure, but I think there are maybe 5,000 players across Europe, across Europe, premiership footballers. That's an incredibly high standard, 5,000. In Formula One, globally, we've got 20. So the odds of getting to Formula yeah. One are absolutely huge. And that's even if you do have huge backing behind you. So maybe, you know, to be a little bit bright, if they're looking for a career in motorsport, super, aim for Formula One, but maybe, you know, keep, the, keep your vision open to think, would I be happy with another position in motorsport, whatever? But I'm not really a great one to give this advice because I didn't take any notice of anybody who said, maybe you should lower your sights, you know? That's the problem. The only thing I would say, you mentioned something about your brother. Uh, now, clearly, of course, he's an awful lot younger than I am. But when I was out there looking for sponsorship, there were no emails. There was no internet. So I was walking around industrial parks, industrial estates, actually knocking on doors, actually talking to the receptionist and talking to him or her to try and chat them up, make them laugh, anything to get to see 
one of their directors yeah. to then sit in front of their director. Now that failed over and over again, but I did have my wins. I did get support like that. So, so many people are bombarded by emails in their office that it loses some of that connection, some of that personal connection. So I think that it's wrong to just rely on sending out emails and think that you've been working hard. That's incorrect. You need to get out there, meet people. But what also you need to do, and this is a commercial thing, and this is, this is business, and it's the same principle as any business. A good deal is only a good deal for both parties or all parties involved. So you've got to make sure that if I'm, if I'm begging for money and if I'm trying to look for some kind of support, I've got to think, hey, hang on, what can I give these people back? Why are they going to, yeah. or yeah. why did they look after Perry McCarthy? Why are they going to take a chance on this kid to help him come through? So it was always thinking, what can I do? What can I organize? But how to stand out? And that was also about how to stand out in life as well. Because on the track, I had very few opportunities coming through. But when I was on there, yeah. and I, I didn't do this every single race, believe me, I made my mistakes and I did have some off days. I, I really did, you know. But often I would do something that was maybe fairly stand out where people went, wow, that's Perry. Yeah. That's the reputation. So even with the money I had or didn't have, I, I did continue to build some reputation going through. So it's all about going after the wins that you can get. So even if your brother did get into F3 with a rubbish team and a rubbish car, if he can show something, it's just that something extra where people are going, wow, we never expected that with that team, that car, your brand building. Yeah. So it's yeah. David and Goliath, yeah. and, but you mustn't get disheartened because again, you know, a light, I don't mean to be too profound here, but I, I have obviously developed some very strong opinions about not just myself, but about other people in life is that you can win even without standing on the top step of the podium. If you can outperform your situation, if you can be the star, if you can get people to look at you, that's what it's all about. You've got to get that. You've got to be standout and you've got to be, it's no good being good. You've got to want it at all costs and you've got to be special, you know? And this is, this is not, oh, I tried it for a year and it was really difficult. So I gave up. This, I, <laughs> I, I wish there had been an A to B for me. This was a, a, a downhill slalom course for me going zigzag to try and go forward just to survive but and it took years unfortunately you know but that that was the downside of having no money it took too long to get to formula one i got there but too long you know but anyway i've i've digressed as you, as i told you earlier i can carry on talking here but i'm gonna stop <laughs> But how beautifully you said to win is not to always stand on the top step. I think that is something that I will also take forward with me in life. Also, digressing from what we were talking about, your screen still glitching and your video is not clear. Just pretend that there's an earthquake here in England, okay? And then that will get sympathy <laughs> from your viewers. Look, watch. Okay, and I'm still giving the interview. <laughs> Yeah, that that's dedication for all our viewers. <laughs> so um, talking about like while we were still on that topic, Lewis Hamilton has also been very vocal about having similar problems, having not people not look like him, having no money, his parents doing multiple jobs to sustain him in that sport. But uh, my question to you is, I recently read somewhere that you said, oh, Lewis should have been an eight-time world champion, but that's another topic. So I wanted you to talk about that because there's been a hell lot of debate where people have been like, oh, he's a seven-time champion, oh, he should be an eight-time champion. What is your take on it? 
Well, I'll, I'll go back to the first thing you said that Lewis said earlier about people like that look like him aren't in Formula One. That he was absolutely right. There's no question at all. Lewis was an absolute breakthrough uh, to um, cut through, let's say, a race. I don't know how better to put it, better to put it, to cut through a race barrier. You know that that was it. And certainly, his family were were absolutely not privileged. Where Lewis was privileged, okay, and it really is important to remember this, is that he did have his father who believed in him from such a young age and his father supported him all the way through. Now, they were from a humble background. So Anthony, his father, and Anthony, I know Anthony, and his, yeah. Anthony just works. He works, works, works. So he was working all the time to make sure Lewis had an opportunity. And then when it got to a particular time in Lewis's teen years, he met Ron Dennis from McLaren and it was a chance meeting. But again, Lewis shouldn't cry too much about lack of support because he had something that a lot of people would have dreamed of having. That was somebody like Ron Dennis, the head of McLaren, come in and believe in you. Now, what Lewis did do is he repaid that belief at every single stage because Lewis is and was brilliant. That was it. So Lewis had the chance and strangled that chance with every shred of his soul. So he repaid. Yeah. But, but Lewis shouldn't talk too much about lack of opportunities. He had some good ones with the family and then Ron came in. But what Lewis did do was he took, as you should do, absolute advantage of those opportunities and showed how brilliant he was. Yeah. Leading on to the second part of what you said, Yes, I am certainly not alone with my opinion on the outcome of the 2021 World Championship. Um, it was, it was a, a travesty of justice. I'm sorry if there are Red Bull fans out there, Max Verstappen fans. This is nothing against Max. It's nothing against Red Bull. Absolutely. A brilliant racing team, an absolutely brilliant racing driver. But that race result was incorrect. There had been a, a huge mess up by the race director, Michael Massey. Absolute massive. And that opinion is, I'd be very confident in saying that's shared by everybody else in Formula One. And probably except the Red Bull team. Yeah. So with that in mind, sorry. So the, the championship was won there and then by Max. And as I underline, I think Max is a brilliant racing driver, absolutely genius, you know? But I do feel that because of certain decisions that were made in the closing stages of that race by the race director, that was taken away from Lewis Hamilton and that would have been his eighth world championship, you know? So. Yeah. Thank you for letting us know about your thoughts on the most debated F1 controversy in decades, I believe. So moving well, on to the ever. next segment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So moving on to the next segment. So we'll talk about something from the archives. And I think this is something that you get asked the most is about your stint as the Stig. Uh, so could you tell us something about your stint at Top Gear and how once Michael came there as a cameo, your best moments of the show? And could you walk us through your journey of Top Gear? Look, now do you recognize me? <laughs> it was me all along. <laughs> um, it, was big stuff. It, was, it was good fun. The, you know, we just talked a little bit about how difficult my journey was coming through motor racing and everybody said you need to write a book so i did and called it flat out flat bro it's going really well we sold another copy just last month okay um <laughs> but we had we had a book launch and it was a big party in london lots of friends from formula one and jeremy clarkson was there as well who's an old friend and jeremy said this was kind of toward the middle of 2002 and jeremy said look we're going to be bringing Top Gear back on air, the BBC TV Top Gear motoring show, which had been quite big. 
but it had been off there and they're going to bring it back. And Jeremy said, we want you to join and we've got an idea for you. We want you to be this kind of secret racing driver. And as you probably know, the first stick was a different color to this stick. I, I was all in black. And Jeremy said, and you're going to wear yeah. black boots, black overalls, black gloves, a black crash helmet, a black visor, and we're going to call you the gimp. I said, the no, gimp. you're not. The gimp. Yeah. I said, look, I've seen <laughs> fiction. I'm not going to be called the gimp. So anyway, it went backward and forward. <laughs> and we agreed on it being called the Stig. And what a great idea it was to keep it secret on who was actually the Stig. Because the question of who is the Stig became one of the top 10 questions asked on the internet. I, I was just behind, is there a God and am I pregnant? <laughs> a great mix of questions to be in. <laughs> Absolutely. So then, of course, the program became so big that we ended up in 215 different territories around the world. So it was, it was amazing. So it was, it was good fun, but, you know, not ideal for me because I am a racing driver and I like racing. So just going, I mean, I always tried, believe me, I was giving it pretty much everything I had with every single car, just out of pride to try and get one more tenth or two more tenths out of something around the Dunstall test track that we had for the Top Gear show. But, you know, my motivation and my fun has been racing. So it wasn't the, the best thing in the world for me, but it was great to try out some different cars, especially some of the quicker ones. So that's really how my involvement with Top Gear came up. And then I said to them, look, I've got some ideas about this creature, this stick. I said, I want it to look otherworldly. So I chose a Simpson helmet, which had this kind of big jaw thing to make it look like Star Wars. I thought I'll do that. And then I thought the stick, he doesn't understand anything. That's how I want him. Doesn't understand people, doesn't understand life, doesn't understand relationships. It, so all the time, I'm just going to have him standing there bored until we can get in a car. And they said, we really like that. So, and then even when they were talking to me on camera, as a stig, I'd just fold my arms and just walk off because I didn't understand people. That was it. All the stig could do is screw him into a car and that's where he lives. So that was what I kind of brought to the party on this one. And it was a good brand development to try and instill that characteristic, that mysterious element. And that is one of the things that got everybody's attention and, and why it became so popular. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen the Big Bang Theory, but uh, how you envisioned the stick sounds a lot like Sheldon Cooper devoid of everything else except for what he wants you wanted racing you wanted motorsports everything else can sit in the corner i'm, I'm gonna take a note of that sheldon cooper i'll, I'll look him up we could have been friends yes <laughs> <laughs> yes yes okay uh also uh my second part of the question was how michael schumacher when the stick became white how he made a cameo there and it went viral if it was a thing back then things going viral but uh do you have any memory of that well it, it was great because the top gear show wanted to test the road car stroke slight race car it's called the Ferrari FXX. <laughs> um, but Ferrari would only let Michael drive there. So Michael came down, then they had the idea to pretend that Michael was the Stig. And of course they got him in the studio and lifted his crash helmet off. So Michael, you know, had a good sense of humor with that and pretended yeah, he was the Stig. Yeah. What really made me laugh was the amount of people across the internet that said, I knew it was Michael Schumacher all along. <laughs> And you're thinking, you know something, Mark was probably worth $200 million or something. He doesn't go to Surrey Racetrack every Wednesday morning to earn some money to be the stick. You know, really. Okay. So, um, but that was Michael's sense of humor and he enjoyed it. And it was just good fun for the program. 
yeah and like going back to michael like when he first arrived in the formula 1 situation were you aware like when you looked at him when you were in the same vicinity or when you spoke to him did you think that this boy this young lad who just happened to be in f1 and like has come here will he go on to make it something as big as like being a seven time world champion and shattering all records all the ceilings that ever possibly were there so we obviously knew michael was very very good as soon as he arrived in formula 1 at the end toward the end of 1991 um because he had the opportunity to drive for the jordan formula 1 team because they had a problem with their other driver bertrand gasho who had actually um had a major legal problem in the uk i won't bore you with that but it left the seat what we call a seat a, a, a drive open at spa So Eddie Jordan did a deal with Mercedes who Michael was under contract with to put Michael in the car. Well, Michael put the car 7th on the grid very very quickly and everybody was astounded by his talent but also his attitude and his level of intelligence being able to work out what's happening with the car and speak to the team which is one of the processes that a top level racing driver always has to be aware of and be skilled in that communication to say this is what i need this is what you need etc but michael was able to do that so quickly so it was obvious he was a stand out talent but immediately he was spotted really by um flavio brutori who was the top guy at the benetton formula 1 team and they made sure that they put michael in their car by firing one of their drivers yeah to put Michael in and keep him clearly of course it is a great decision because Michael immediately was at the front and then very shortly after went on to win um grand uh, formula 1 world championships back to back i think it was 84 and 85 uh for benetton so just a couple of years afterward you know, was, yeah 94 yeah yeah 94 and 95 i think he won the two world championships for benetton obviously before he went on to ferrari yes i only crossed paths with michael several yes. times and i always liked michael i hope he liked me as well i some people have been saying in press that we were pals recently we weren't we we got on we weren't close friends or anything like that um but i always thought that michael had a a human side to him not necessarily in the car i might add but as a as a as a human being i think he had quite a big heart actually you know so yeah i've uh, always had a huge obviously a huge respect for michael schumacher um not with some of the moves that he did on some of the other drivers not always you know but as a as a force of nature and that's some of the things and some of the reasons why the man apart from his talent went on to win seven world championships incredible that's absolutely incredible while you were explaining it i got goosebumps all over and i think my mom she doesn't follow formula 1 but she she's always known who michael schumacher is so he's a name that big however yeah. it's been 10 years to his accident and when that happened it shook not just the motor sporting world the entire sporting world on the globe how did that affect you like how did that news come about to you and how have you remembered michael over the course of these 10 years i think that the overall feeling is of just such sadness for michael and of course his family uh corina his wife and and mickey's son and other members of the family it's just to have somebody of that character of that achievement of that talent you know it's it's terrible if it happens to anybody of course but because michael was so in the public eye and so such a legend to see that happen is it's just incredibly sad i i don't think there's any other way to put it and i do i do like probably many other people i do spare thoughts to michael to this day and just think oh goodness poor michael and all we can do is hope that he's comfortable and that his family are comfortable with him you know but it's just a a tragedy an absolute tragedy
absolutely absolutely and like when we're talking about michael so somebody ashish, said like um, when yeah. he was in his prime sorry and i should explain uh, that could you... for those for those listeners or viewers of yours that don't know is that michael's skiing accident yeah. of course didn't kill him he sustained a terrible blow to the head which left him in a coma for quite a while and as even though details of his exact condition have been kept very quiet by the family and maintained that way for the last 10 years so we're not completely clear of his condition but we can certainly pretty much guess that his condition isn't very good even to this day otherwise he clearly would have been more in the public space so that's sorry just to ex- give some context to what's happened to michael from being a active very fit man to clearly of course having suffered catastrophic injuries and um having uh, his life changed dramatically i think it's fair to say that yes it's absolutely devastating even to think of that however my next question which i was leading up to was when michael was in his prime at that time also he could walk uh, on the stre- streets of the usa and not being rec- not be recognized by many because initially i think before the drive to survive revolution uh, formula 1 was mainly a european centric sport so what do you have to say about the drive to survive revolution that netflix brought in to like change the face of formula 1 in a country like america we have three races there now so something has boomed there what is your take on that so america has always loved its motorsport um but previously i would say that the top level of motorsport in america even though formula 1 has been going now for, certainly from the 60s onwards um it's it's never been embraced to the level as you quite rightly say that it is now but they they do have a love of motorsport and of of course there are many different disciplines of motorsport but the biggest ones would have been nascar for the americas and also for indycar but you're absolutely right to yes. cite the netflix show drive to survive because that seems to have really landed and that inside documentary fly on the wall approach with the humor and also you know the way they generate a little bit of drama has absolutely caught the imagination in the states and so it's been this incredible catalyst to bring more people to grand prix but then to make america feel hey you know something this is really getting the attention of the american marketplace we should run more races So this show has been this unexpected catalyst that has had a huge result and impact on Formula 1 and of course the uptake of F1 in America because now we have three races in North America which is Miami, Las Vegas and Austin in Texas and of course yeah, we have Montreal, Canada, you know, a little bit further north but it's just incredible to see and most of us put it down to the to the um Netflix show as you said so absolutely amazing it's great to see the americans embracing formula 1 now you know it's it's becoming more of a more of a global sport clearly of course you know russia is off the table as far as hosting a race is concerned but it does show that we shouldn't think in terms of limiting formula 1's impact to just america because from a socioeconomic position Formula One is highly attractive to different territories, and that's why so many different countries are often wanting to be considered to host a race, even if it costs them several hundred million pounds to develop a facility, and even if they have to pay an awful lot of money to Formula One for the privilege of holding that race each year across a five, six, seven—I'm not privy to this, but whatever term of contract it is. it just shows that they deem it worth it because of the global attention it brings to that location so from a business perspective yes. tourism perspective so on and so forth so that shows that the power of formula 1 from being a global force and the image that it comes hand in hand with yeah so when you're talking about power of formula 1 
it made gunther steiner a household name i think he became more popular than most of the drivers when drive to survive came out however the current biggest trend in this off season is that he's left the team so what is your take on that he's left us it's it's very difficult for me to you know other than confirm you're correct he is out of hass and you can only you get the feeling that there's some friction there because any time that a team principal leaves a team and there's a press release and he's not quoted on the press release you kind of think so I mean, this is one of the things about formula 1 is reading behind the scenes or reading between the lines so something's happened there but what they've done is that they've gone to a more engineering led position to to run the team from an engineering position so yeah. you know gunther people shouldn't underrate gunther steiner because he is a highly intelligent guy he's a real character but he's very very intelligent very determined so the team have chosen really to i think that perhaps they've seen what mclaren did a while back where they brought in Andrea Stella as more of an engineering team principal and the acceleration up the grid from a bad start actually it's terribly unusual McLaren had a bad start to 2023 then ended up as being quite a viable challenger to the all dominant Red Bull team yeah. so you know so maybe they maybe they're going that route There's always an upside or a downside to any decision that and that includes setting a race car up aerodynamically you know you go up on the wing you get more downforce but you got more drag you know it's a balancing act and it's the same thing with let's say positioning people in this so they've clearly made this decision to go engineering led but to a degree they will miss some of some of Gunter's a personality uh, magnetism drawing sponsors in and also his political uh, capital that he enjoys through the paddock in formula 1 on getting somebody's ear and being involved in that so th- there's maybe a loss there but maybe maybe who knows again in going engineering led but this is this really is where f1 is it's it's such a an exercise in advanced engineering um so maybe that's their route we will see I mean they've got two fantastic drivers Kevin Magnussen and Nico Hulkenberg um and the team is is a great team it it really is but you know they they clearly finished I think they finished last in the constructor championship last year the problem is somebody's got to finish last and believe me I know that <laughs> unfortunately you know we have the jokes back it was getting a little too serious so you thought you'd segue that in beautiful timing i guess exactly my my joke timer went off and just said now now stop it <laughs> i i i think my cheeks hurt because i've laughed so much i thought it will be a very very serious one where you where else you've made me laugh so much thank you for that thank you very so much so i think uh, coming on to the last question so another recent occurrence in formula 1 has been FIA's uh, initiative where they've talked about they wanted to make karting cheaper and lewis has been constantly harping on this fact that this is uh, a very very expensive sport so a lot of talent cannot get in like we're circling back to something we talked in the starting of the interview but uh, lewis has been harping about this a lot that this needs to be taken into account that something like karting or initial stages of formula racing or single seater racing need to be cheaper and we know that you've struggled with something like that so what is your take on this move that fia wants to make i don't know i think they're wasting their time <laughs> you know it's i i just can't possibly see how the FIA can police uh karting budgets globally there are so many different championships local championships regional championships national then international championships you know and then the the next problem any participant any competitor faces is that okay maybe they've taken some money off the real price of karting but it's still 
unbelievably expensive. You know, you still need some money. I mean, you know, from my background when I was younger, you know, it's you you're not exactly in a position to go and get a new school uniform. You know, it's let alone take your son karting. So there, I you know, I think that sometimes. If they're going to carry, if they're going to look to carry that cost cap, no, it's rubbish. I, I just don't see. I'm sorry. I'm not. It's it's a waste of time. I just don't see how they're going to have the resources to implement any series of races that have got a cost cap. And then how on earth are they going to try and police that cost cap to make sure that you know, Joey over there can get another set of new tires and another set of new tires and another engine reel? I just, I, I just don't see it. I, I really don't. So wrong subject for me, Anna. Maybe I'm too cynical on that one, but maybe it's just, maybe it's as well to be, to save wasting, to save wasting time. That's, that's all there is to it. Yeah. If you implement, if you, if you bring maybe. cost caps in, they have to be policed. They have to be. And then who's going to pay for the scrutineering on whether it's the, their accounting records yeah. or who's using what or whatever. So, you know, Sorry, it's a tough game. Yeah. There is an easier way to do this. If you think it's going to be too tough, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> when somebody as gifted as you, you are with words, you went quiet. You paused for a couple of seconds before answering that. I, I, I actually saw this coming. I knew that you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be very much in favor of what they're trying to do. But yeah, I oh, think I that with that, we've... The, the principle is wonderful, but but the execution of it is <laughs> like it stands more chance of winning a world championship than I did. You know? <laughs> so I think with that we've come to the end of our no, interview. I just got that the wrong way around. Been an absolute... I just got that joke the wrong way around. I'm sorry, come. On. I just got that joke the wrong way around. <laughs> I should have said I stood more chance of winning a world championship than that stands for going through. Yeah, I, I, got that. Thank you very much. I got that. I laughed it off. I th I thought you didn't realize it, so I laughed it off because I got the meaning. I I I think in this span of forty minutes, I know that you humor will take a front seat when it, whenever such questions come in, exactly. and it has been an absolute honor talking to you it was wonderful i hope we can continue this association with essentially sports and perry mccarthy it has been so so wonderful talking to you and we wish you all the best for your future endeavors and i believe and i hope that this association can do wonders in the world out there with that well, i think i'll stop the recording talking about doing wonders in the world anna okay before we come off Tell your viewers in, in uh, India and also America, I can come out and give these speeches firsthand if they're a marketing director or if they've got a big <laughs> company. I'm on the website, Perry McCarthy. Absolutely. Find me. I'll come. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bye-bye.